Dr. Craig also asserts that objective moral values depend on God. Well, the overwhelming majority of people who have thought carefully about the nature of morality, including many theists, and as you heard from a quotation from my book, myself, would disagree. And it's not difficult to see why. Ethicists develop moral theories that, among other things, try to explain and justify the thought that people, and in some cases animals, have moral worth, that we really matter. Ethicists have considered the possibility that this moral worth might depend on God in some way. Well, think about it. How might that work? Could it be that God simply decides that we have moral value? That doesn't seem right, because uh, we don't suppose that God could simply decide that, say, a lump of coal is as valuable as a person. Rather, it must be that God recognizes something about us that is morally important. Maybe it's our capacity to suffer or to have interests and plans or to make promises. But if that's right, then God falls out of the picture. It's these morally important features that determine our value, and these we have in virtue of facts about us, not facts about God. The existence of objective moral values does not entail the existence of God. Now as to the argument from the resurrection, I concede that if Jesus had been raised from the dead by God, then that would constitute pretty powerful evidence for the claim that God exists. But what reasons have we been given to believe it? Dr. Craig has pointed to three facts that he says are best explained by the hypothesis that Jesus was resurrected by God. First, the empty tomb. Now he says that all the alternative explanations of what happened to Jesus' body have been rejected universally by New Testament scholars. I'm afraid this is just a gross overstatement. The truth is that some have been rejected, uh, some are more plausible than others, and that each leaves some questions unanswered. But such is the nature of inquiry into the distant past. For instance, it's not implausible to suppose that after a temporary internment in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb during the Sabbath, Jesus' body was moved to a common grave, as was customary for those who were crucified as criminals. While this leaves some questions unanswered, it's surely more probable, given our total evidence and background knowledge, than the hypothesis that Jesus was miraculously raised from the dead by God. As for Dr. Craig's two other facts, the post-crucifixion appearances and the disciples' belief in the resurrection, there's no corroborative evidence for these claims besides the Gospels themselves. Later mentions by non-biblical, non-Christian sources were references to the Gospels. And we have good reason to be highly skeptical of the Gospels as reliable historical documents of such matters. In his first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture. He was buried and raised the third day. If Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Now, most people think of these core Christian doctrines as being based on the Gospels, but that's historically backwards. The Gospels were written between the years 65 and 100, a generation after Paul began preaching about the resurrection to early Christian communities. The Gospels were not written by Jesus' disciples or any other eyewitnesses to the events of his life. In fact, almost nothing is known about the authors except that they were partisans of a new, vibrant, growing religion that was built on the belief in the resurrection. So the Gospels, as you and I know them, are not historical accounts by eyewitnesses, but were produced by a careful process of selection and editing and rewriting undertaken over an extended period, hundreds of years, by early Christians in order to record an approved theology of the emerging church and to aid its missionary expansion. In sum, we can explain the empty tomb without resorting to the extraordinary claim that Jesus was raised from the dead by God, and Christ's appearances and the disciples' convictions, the other alleged facts to which Dr. Craig appeals, I think lack credibility as real historical events and have corroboration only in the Gospels themselves. By the way, uh, Craig cites the skeptical German theologian Gerd Lüdemann as a uh, someone who, in a, in a way that makes it look as though uh, Garrett believes that uh, 
Jesus, the risen Jesus, actually appeared to the disciples. Um, Gert's a friend of mine and a colleague at the Center for Inquiry, and I asked him if that's what he meant. And um, he said, no, Craig had misused my words. What he really believes is that uh, the disciples had hallucinations. They had visions of Jesus, just as people have visions of Mary today, and that caused them to uh, believe. Finally, on the idea that we can experience God directly. Well, ordinary sensory experiences, like seeing or touching this podium, are perceptual. That is, they're caused by an object existing independently of the experience, and they're what's called veridical, conveying accurate information about that object. But not every experience is like this. Uh, when I hit my head and, quote, see stars, I'm really not seeing anything. If I am on an LSD trip, I may see things, but my experiences aren't veridical. So there's no doubt that people do have religious experiences. I know people do have them because as a Christian, I had some. But the question is whether they are typically perceptual and veridical in character. And Dr. Craig has not shown this. What has been shown by neuroscientists like Michael Persinger is that by stimulating certain areas of the brain, it's possible to generate mystical experiences. Now, I'm not claiming that all people who have mystical religious experiences are delusional, but only that Craig has not shown that such experiences are perceptions of God. For all we know, they could be like hearing a song in your head, just an interesting non-perceptual or non-veridical uh, experience for which we can thank our amazing brains. So, in conclusion, I'm afraid that none of the reasons presented by Dr. Craig provide compelling evidence for theism. Thank you.